I would say that if we're in a period of expanding liquidity, you want to be moving more into cyclicals vis-a-vis -vis defensives. Um, and I think things like technology should continue to do extremely well in this environment. Again, if you believe in longer term monetary inflation risks, which we do, then you've got to have uh, exposure to commodity shares. So I think a barbell strategy of holding technology and commodities would make a lot of sense in the sort of environment we see upcoming. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with liquidity and market expert Michael Howell. If you haven't yet watched part one of this discussion with Michael, in which he explains why the financial system is at a liquidity inflection point that he expects will send asset prices higher over the coming year, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. And Michael also kindly shares his thoughts for a portfolio structure that he thinks will perform well in the investing climate he sees ahead. So get ready to take good notes. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Michael Howell. If this is the time, and again, don't let me put words in your mouth, but if this is the time to be greedy when other, others are fearful uh, and to start re-entering the market um, when when you know folks are still worried about where things are going and hopefully that means you're getting better values today than you'll get tomorrow mm -hmm. how how do you think uh this is best played um you you mentioned a couple of of assets like precious metals and cryptos and in in the high tech high growth tech stocks they move first so they've already started to respond you know, is it still good to ride those guys or have they played out here? Is it time to be focused on other parts of the asset Let mix? Me, this is this chart here you can see is basically or hopefully see is looking at what we call monetary hedges and the global liquidity cycle. So it's pretty much like um, the the previous chart that you were looking at, which was global liquidity. But this one is basically looking at what's happening to the values of crypto and gold uh, together as a universe in orange and the global liquidity cycle here in black. But it's showing that actually monetary inflation hedges move very closely with the global liquidity cycle, which is why you know, we can be more confident the liquidity is picking up because you're seeing this companion increase in those asset classes. If you're going to get further gains in global liquidity, what you're likely to see is further gains in uh, in these uh, assets like crypto and gold, that's for sure. The next thing I think to look at is the impact that liquidity has on the treasury yield curve. Now, this chart um, shows you our index of global liquidity for the US in orange, and the yield curve has been advanced here by nine months. And what this is basically trying to illustrate is that, <clears throat> that as, um, excuse me, as liquidity expands, so you get an inflection upwards in the slope of the yield curve. So that is something which is beginning to unfold right now. So you could look forward and say, if we're going to get further liquidity increases, the yield curve should be steepening. So if you're investing in bond arbitrage strategies, you're likely to make decent money in this environment. So those are two asset classes. I would say that if we're in a period of expanding liquidity, you want to be moving more into cyclicals vis-a-vis -vis defensives. Um, and I think things like technology should continue to do extremely well in this environment. Again, if you believe in longer term monetary inflation risks, which we do, then you've got to have uh, exposure to commodity shares. So I think a barbell strategy of holding technology and commodities would make a lot of sense in the sort of environment we see upcoming. Um, all right, that's super interesting. So barbell, tech, one side, commodities on the other. Um, for commodities, do you have any any point of view on owning the commodities themselves versus owning the producers, which tend to be a bit more leveraged plays on the commodities? Um, not not especially. I mean, I, you know, we're not experts on commodities per se, so I think it's very difficult for us to sort of to 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 say that. I mean, you know, you know, broadly. Uh, I'm thinking here of, uh, of generally commodity prices, so things like copper or gold or whatever. Uh, but, you know, as you rightly say, I mean, commodity companies are leveraged to that. Okay. Um, and if you could help just just 
you know, I, I find that that folks watching bond math is always a little bit tricky and non-intuitive to, to certain folks. So you, you showed the chart there about expecting the yield curve to, to steepen. What impact would do, you, you mentioned for those that are doing a bond arbitrage, uh, there may be an opportunity to to get some gains there. What specifically, what 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 strategy for bonds do you think would play out in the type of future that you see coming? Well, I think if you if you're going to get a steeper yield curve, uh, what that what that would be basically saying is that yields at the longer end are moving uh, upwards uh, at a faster rate than uh, the yields uh, at the shorter end. I mean, the, the the relative speed of movement. So, in other words, the yield curve is beginning to steepen because that longer end is going up faster. So, you want to be shorter uh, of that of that area and longer at the short, uh, uh, have more exposure at the shorter end in that regard. Okay. So in other words, what that's really saying is another way of looking at it in probably in more straightforward terms is you want to go long uh, short dated uh, instruments. So you, in other words, short rates will be coming down significantly, which means the prices of their instruments will be going up faster. Got it. That and makes sense? It does make sense. And it, 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 one of the reasons why I just wanted to dig into that is we've had some experts on the program right now say that uh, they think that the, the bond market is 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 actually quite attractive right now um, because they expect uh, some sort of a uh, you know, uh, some sort of event, some sort of breakage in the system that's going to make capital flood into. And they're talking mostly sovereigns here. Uh, the you know treasury bond market, the longer end of the curve, and so. Um, uh, you know, there are some people saying this is a really good time to start going out long duration. Uh, on on the bond curve, and what I hear you saying is is that's not what your models are Correct. saying. Your models are basically saying the opposite. Yeah, exactly right. You don't. I mean, I don't think there's any point in owning the long end of the bond market, particularly. I mean, this we keep saying this is the stage of the cycle where long dated debt does not perform particularly well. Doesn't perform badly. Let's be clear about that. You get moderate returns out of out of fixed income, long dated fixed income around this stage of the cycle. The best stage of the cycle for fixed income, uh, longer dated, is much later in the cycle than where we are now. This is the stage where you start to get the yield curve beginning to steepen, but you want to make you're going to make more money at short dated. Uh, you won't make a lot of money, but you'll you'll make more out of buying short dated instruments, uh, expecting their rates to come down. The long end won't move much, and the reason the long end won't move much is that and this is going to get in terribly wonkish territory. But mm -hmm. because term premia are hugely negative right now in the system. And that's what, you know, a lot of these optimists about bonds are not really figuring. Uh, figuring. Why is it the term, you, know, you look at ter term premium or the risk premium that you hold in a bond uh, for interest rate risk over the lifetime of the bond, okay? So it's unexpected movements. Now, that term premia is skewed significantly by an excess demand for collateral by some of the big financial institutions. And they have to own um, this debt for balance sheet reasons. And it's made, uh, things like Basel III or Solvency II, people would have heard of. These are requirements that the banks and the insurance companies need. And longer dated US treasuries tick that box. So they tend to buy them. Now, there's a shortage in the system of that, of that good collateral. Okay. And that's what's driving term premium down, excess demand for that uh, in the system. So what you've got now is a huge, huge anomaly, which gets very little commentary. And that is that term premium in the US are not only negative, but they're at their lowest, almost at their lowest ever level in 60 years of data. Right? Wow. That sticks out like a sore thumb. And that I think can term premium can only go up from here, not down. Or the odds are uh, that's true. I think my my camera is playing tricks. Here. I was just about to mention that. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but anyway, um, maybe that's better. All right, uh, that is better. I think we got it. I was just about to. Yeah, you, it was just all of a sudden you were on the corner of the screen and it was losing its focus on you, but. It's right. good. The quality of what you were saying was so riveting. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> um, okay. Let me know when you're you're ready for one last question on this. No, point. it's fine. You go for it. Okay. 
Um, all right. Well, look, one last question for you here on, on bonds, Michael, which is um, uh, uh, several of the recent experts on this channel, I have asked the question, do you believe the peak in bond yields uh, is in, uh, is behind us at this point? And increasingly, uh, the number of experts that I've talked to recently have said, yes, they, they, they would not be surprised if the peak in bonds was behind us. Um, I'm intuiting for what you've been saying that you might have a different answer to that. But I'm again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what do you think? Well, I think I think it's possible. I mean, I'm not uh, I would be more hesitant of that. I think the you know, the issue is, is that a bond uh, that uh, if you take the 10 year bond yield, it consists of two moving parts. One is a term premium, which is abnormally low. And the other is uh, a rate expectation, which is abnormally high from recent over recent experience. Mm -hmm. And I would be absolutely confident that that rate expectation term comes down. But I would be hesitant about saying it comes down dramatically, because I don't think the Federal Reserve will want to uh, slash rates in the way that people are suggesting. Because if you slash rates, you're back in the old problem of incentivizing debt again. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid debt uh, at all costs, taking on more debt. On the other side of the ledger, the term premia is at rock bottom levels and I think can only go up. So my view for the bond market this year is it's in a trading range. Uh, it's a wash, in other words. So I think that you're going to get reasonable returns out of bonds, moderate returns. But that is pretty much the carry in the, uh, you know, on the coupon. You, you might get, I don't think you're going to get much more than that. I think you're going to get much capital gain out of it. You might get a bit, but I don't think much. Okay. So it, it does sound like you, you see more opportunity both in the equity markets and yeah. on the commodity side of things. Um, in terms of sort of magnitude of what you expect, you know, given the turn we're making here, um, w when would you sort of expect to see like the s p hit new highs is that something you'd see this year given the type of move you're looking at or will it take longer than that i think we i think we could do it this year for sure yeah i mean we're not what are we now i'm trying to think what the math is it's probably probably eight percent below the peak uh where are we really i'm 41 something right now the peak was what around 46 ish or so yeah so about that yeah okay um so, so again quite probably you, you, you 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 are I, I believe more sanguine than most of the the guests that have been on this program recently, and it's been fascinating to understand why. So again, you you the message I'm getting from you is don't be overly fearful here. This is probably a time to sort of start dollar cost averaging in as you're taking advantage of what you believe to be better values today than we'll see at the end of the year, and that you know increasing your long exposure maybe in a barbell style like you're mentioning. Um, you know, should should pay dividends as the year progresses and, and and those tailwinds become even stronger. Yeah, I think it depends on people's time horizon. I mean, clearly, if you're investing for three months, don't do that sort of thing. Yeah. But if you're investing for three years or longer, absolutely, yeah. Makes a lot of sense, I think. Okay, great. And 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 last thing I just want you to kind of confirm with you is is you you're pretty you're pretty optimistic about the next couple of years. You mentioned that these tailwinds based upon the cycle, should last somewhere into 2025? Well, I mean, let, let's be clear. I'm not necessarily optimistic on the economies because I think yep. we're, we're suffering this Japanification, which means that you've got, you know, challenges on productivity growth. You've got demographic, uh, demographic aging and deteriorating labor force. So, you know, this is not back to the boom, boom years that we saw in the 60s or in the 90s or whatever. You know, it's a different, it's a different paradigm. Um, so we may be seeing sluggish Japan-like growth, but for the asset market, it's a very different question. And I think that if you've got central banks that are pumping in liquidity and you've got investors that are probably going to probably uh, rightly going to avoid bonds because of the inflation risk, I think equities will pick up a bid. And I think you go back, go back to the results season that we've just come through in the US. I would have said that's actually broadly pretty encouraging. I mean, corporations can make money through this period. There's a lot of uncertainty, but they seem to be, uh, you know, generally quite upbeat. And I think that's quite a good uh, heads up. All right, great. Well, one of the things I've been saying a lot of this channel is, is, you know, a lot, a lot of our guests have been relatively uh, pessimistic about the prospects for the economy. And I would say most of them for the markets in terms of their outlook for this year. Uh, I and many of them have said, we can't wait till we get to the point in the cycle where we can start telling a more bullish story. 
I'll say you're one of the earlier bulls here uh, to come on, but you've given us a lot of, you know, very compelling reasons why. Um, let's hope that your outlook indeed proves out here. And, and this channel is all about helping people build wealth. And you're you're basically pointing a direction to say, hey, this this looks like a way that we can do this over the next couple of years. Uh, so anyways, Michael, let's wrap it up here. Thank you so much for giving us so much of your time for staying late uh, in your offices in London to have this conversation with us. Pleasure. For folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, maybe this is the first time they've they've heard of you or maybe the first time they've been able to listen to you at length like this. Um, for those folks that are interested in following you and your work, where should they go? We've got a website, which is crossbordercapital.com. And we've got um, uh, a Twitter feed, crossbordercap, at crossbordercap. And if you want to, if you get sleepless nights and you want to read a book about all this, uh, it's called uh, Capital Wars. It's available on, on Amazon, uh, published by Macmillan Palgrave. Fantastic. Michael, when we edit this, I'll put up the URLs to your website, your Twitter handle. We'll put uh, a, a image of your book on the screen when you're mentioning it there so folks know exactly where to go. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion, Michael. Again, I really appreciate you taking so much time to walk us through all this in detail um, and for giving so much of your time again late on your day. Really hope uh, you come back on the channel at some point uh, in the future. If you're open, maybe in a quarter, we'll give you a chance to come on and kind of give an update as to where things are based upon what you share with us today. Okay, look forward to it, Adam. Thanks. Well, all right. Well, now is the part of the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the financial advisory firms endorsed by Wealthion to uh, do a little uh, post-game review of what Michael told us uh, and then talk about what the markets have been up to over the past week. There's also uh, some pretty big developments uh, going on. Guys, uh, we're going to have, um, right, unfortunately, right after we finish recording here, uh, the Fed is going to announce uh, its decision uh, here in the uh, first week in May on uh, whether or not it's going to hike rates once again. And then, of course, Powell will come out and uh, give a press conference. Uh, we'll deconstruct that for folks next week. Uh, but as usual, I'm joined here by John Lodra and Mike Preston. Guys, thanks for joining. Uh, Mike, why don't we start with you? Um, what did you think about Michael's uh, interview there? Uh, you know, a little bit of a different tune than many of our recent past experts. He definitely is a little bit more optimistic uh, with his whole, you know, liquidity model here, thinking that uh, we might have just started a multi-year bull run. Hi, Adam. Uh, thanks for having us back. Like usual, uh, I enjoyed Michael's talk. Michael is with uh, Cross Border Capital in London, I believe. And you know, Michael is very bullish, and it's nice that you have some different perspectives on this program. Both uh, people that are cautious about the markets, but uh, but 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 also ones that see some uh, bullish slants. And his argument, Michael's argument, is about liquidity. He says that liquidity bottomed uh, in October of twenty-two, really kind of on the heels of. The Bank of England, uh, England reversing, uh, and uh, it's tightening, and, and that was because of the guilt crisis. So they basically reversed course and, uh, you know, started their liquidity program again. And he then says that other central banks have followed suit after that, and there is some truth to that. And we've seen we've seen the S and P really bottom in October, and it's been on a pretty relentless upswing since then. However, the bigger picture that we really didn't focus on, uh, or that I didn't hear too much. In, in, in his talk that we really are worried about is the, the macro environment of supreme overvaluation. Uh, markets are very overvalued. In fact, they're, they're more overvalued than they were at the tops of the very tippity tops of other times in the market that were very severely overvalued, like uh, 1929 and the very peak of the tech bubble. So um, we, we can't forget that. He, he offers some other very good arguments too that um, could cause more liquidity come into the markets like for instance oil looking at oil right now it's having another big down day it was uh, down yesterday it's down again today trading at around 68 dollars a barrel i mean it was it was right around 100 dollars not too long ago you know and so it's been in a pretty steep downtrend if that continues that could cause some liquidity um but the big picture with the with the markets is this the s p is up seven percent year to date but it's down 14% from its all-time high. The NASDAQ has been the leader of 20% or so year-to-date, but down 23% from its all-time high. These markets topped sometime in November of 21 through January of 22, in our opinion, and they're still early on in a very, very, uh, in, in my opinion, slow-moving bear market. And the risks are certainly to the downside, we believe. Um, he, he is bullish, not just on equities, but on commodities, real assets, 
Uh, we've been long-term believers in gold and silver and the mining companies. In fact, we think the commodities will do very well over the entire next 10 years, or maybe more. And so we'd be looking to add exposure to commodities on any weakness. You know, frankly, right now we're looking at the oil sector. I mentioned oil just a minute ago, trading at around 68. If we see the bottom fall out of the S&P like we think can happen, and we still think the S&P could have an elevated drop down to about 3,200 or so, we'd be looking to opportunistically buy in the oil sector. Uh, we could see prices 10 to 20% below current prices pretty pretty rapidly, and that would be a good time for a hedged entry in our opinion. So I will pause there uh, for, for just a moment. There's much more in the talk that we can that we can comment on. All right, and John, I'll come to you here in a sec. Um, yeah, and in addition to the um, interview here with Michael, there's some topical things going on I want to make sure we touch on too. Um, but it is really interesting. Um, you know, when I first started hearing Michael talk about liquidity, I, the challenge I had in my mind, which I'm going to guess maybe other listeners did too, was, wow, um, you know, it really seems like from everything we're reading about, uh, that liquidity is getting tighter uh, right now. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I asked Michael near the end how he defines liquidity, and, and not everybody is is measuring it with the same yardstick. Um but uh, you know, we 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 are on the tail end now of of the better part of a year, uh, in fact, a little over a year of the Fed and the other world central banks really out there trying to destroy demand, right? Um, to tame inflation and uh, to destroy demand, you're you're deliberately trying to slow the economy, and we are seeing lots of signs, lots of indicators that we've talked about many times in the past on this program that are now at recession levels. And yet a recession has yet to arrive. And we've talked a lot about um, the significance of the lag effect when it comes to monetary policy, you know, that it can take about a year from the pulling of a lever uh, monetary policy wise until you see that fully reflected in the economy. And, you know, we're, we're about a year from those first rate hikes last year. And we have a whole, you know, 475 basis points, you know, that we got to feel the full lag effect of over time here. And that's going to be hitting again and again and again over the next couple of quarters. Which again, I sort of think is is you know something that depresses the economy, um, and so I guess the big question I have is, I mean, it's hard to argue with his data, right? He's got that that um, chart of liquidity, changes in liquidity, and he overlays that with uh, sort of that sine wave of what happens with asset prices, and you know the correlation is incredibly tight, so you know we can't ignore it, right? You know, if 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 as he measures liquidity, we have hit an inflection point and things are going back up, you know, we've got to have an eye out that, okay, that really maybe could goose prices for the next 60 months from here, I think he said. Um, but my question, I'll come to you with this, John, that I'm still sort of batting around in my brain is, is, is what sort of wins out? Uh, if you have increasing liquidity, the way in which Michael measures it, but you have a contracting economy, um, and if we get, you know, Michael Kantrowitz's uh, final E, the employment domino in his hope framework, if that does tip over and it kind of becomes game on recession wise, what wins out when it comes to asset prices, right? Does does liquidity push them higher no matter what? Or as Mike is saying, look, valuations are really distorted to the upside. And if we go into a full blown recession, they're going to have to come down no matter what liquidity is doing. I'm curious if you've got an opinion on that. Yeah, thank you, Adam, and, and great to be with you again, and great to hear a, a fresh new perspective um, from your guest. Um, yeah, so so anybody would be forgiven to to uh, certainly given the last decade to to make a direct linkage between contraction and expansion of liquidity and asset prices. I mean, we've been trained almost Pavlovian to to see it and expect asset prices to respond that way. I think there's some some real context that gets lost though in looking. For example, at just the last decade, where we've had monetary policies to play with liquidity like never before, and um, to understand that liquidity uh, isn't always um, going to be looking for asset assets to find a home in. You know, when when uh, base reserves were were forced down to zero percent interest rate, folks desperately wanted to find a better home from them, and they they would chase yield to to do that. We now have a situation where, at least presently, um, uh, base reserves in the form of short-term money funds, uh, T-bills and money market accounts, things like that, are actually commanding uh, or paying a, a very quite attractive uh, rate of interest from a short-term standpoint. Um, 
you know, so there isn't that same compulsion, I think, that perhaps existed in, in the wake of the housing crisis that, you know, press liquidity and, and immediately finds a home and, and asset prices. Um, you know, people, and, I, and I'm going to kind of relate back to a, a quote from, from Darius Dale in, in last week's video, you know, you know, basically the, the notion that people, there's a difference between bearish and there's, there's a, a, between being bearish and being scared. And I think we're seeing um, some, some fear starting to creep into the markets about the banking stresses, which quite clearly, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure uh, in, in more detail, um, th this notion that it's 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 behind us, I think, is very naive, and we've we've even heard some folks like former Fed uh, officials, you know, come out and say we think there's a lot more going on here than than perhaps we were expecting. Um, so so there's a fear factor, and, and we start to think of liquidity as as collateral, and and uh, you know th there's a there's a, a rush to collateral, whether it's because of the banking issues and. You know, there's this big uh, storm cloud that has all the markings of of yet to come and and be a real problem in the commercial real estate market. But that 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 shoe has really not yet dropped. It's it's almost seemingly out there, and and people know that it's a problem, and likely will be a problem. But so so I I would I would challenge the the knee jerk reaction that that even if we are seeing more liquidity coming into the system. That it doesn't mean that liquidity is is an inferior place to be. You know, sometimes when you're holding zero percent cash, it's an inferior place to be compared to other things. Uh, when you're holding cash that's yielding five percent, it's not an inferior place place to be, especially when there's this fear and, and legitimate fear about um, the need for safe collateral and uh, and uh, you know implosions of things like commercial real estate. And then I'll just point to two two realities. I mean, you look at the, the tech bubble collapse of two thousand and the housing bubble collapse. Uh, prior to quantitative easing, um, the Fed's policy to, to make conditions tight or looser was to drop the interest rate. Right? But in both of those instances, their rapid drop of the, the short-term interest rates did nothing to stem a, a massive sell-off over a short number of months in, in the stock market. So I think it's really, we've got to be very careful to, especially in the overvalued stock markets, uh, assume that it's just quite that easy. And I, you know, we, we very much believe that Valuations do matter, and and we're likely to see um, liquidity not be this quick, uh, you know, solve and and uh, back to the races uh, impetus that we've been trained to think is is destiny uh, over the last decade. Well, well, well said, John. And you touched upon a couple of things there that um, I want to tug at here. Um, you know, one part of liquidity is um, you know banks providing. Uh, loans out there, right? You know, to to spur economic activity. Um, we we have uh, tightening lending standards across the banking uh, sector right now. Uh, they were tightening coming into this year to begin with, but then of course we had the bank failures. Uh, we just had a brand new one last week. Uh, First Republic Bank uh, finally uh, bit the dust, uh, and so I think we've had three of the four largest bank failures in U.S. history in the past two months. Um, so understandably, banks are even more conservative with their lending right now. Uh, Jerome Powell has actually talked about this. He said that that acts as additional rate hikes on top of what the Fed uh, is doing. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, big questions about, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, what the ripple effects that going to be and, and how much tighter is that going to be? Um, but certainly what it's doing is it's it's reducing liquidity, getting out into the real economy. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some former Fed uh, officials were, were, you know, of late recent uh, raising warnings. Uh, we just had today uh, former Fed President um, Kaplan uh, said that the bank pain is just getting started and he's really urging Powell to pause, not even hike rates at, at this point in time. Um, we're going to find out what, what Powell and the folks at the Fed decided to do in about an hour or two, like I said. Um, but, uh, you know, you've got the high ranking former officials at the Fed who are now really, you know, getting worried. Right. Um, but the other complicating factor, which I think you gave a quick nod to, is uh you know, you have you have money that's now flowing out of the banking system uh, in addition to the tightening uh, lending standards because uh, deposit holders can get better returns on their cash by putting it in a brokerage and a money market account there or buying T-bills. 
uh, and we've been talking about this, you know, for for a number of weeks, months now on this program. Um, this is kind of like Gresham's law, right? Money's just going to where it's better treated. So it's it's fleeing, you know, those deposits are fleeing the banking system. And of course, that just makes the smaller players even more vulnerable. Um, so uh, I guess maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just go back to you real, real quick here, John, but like, you know, we, we have this confluence right now that just seems to be continuing to sort of tighten the screws on liquidity, at least inside the banking system here. And again, I, I'm not trying to contradict what Michael was saying. And again, he sort of has his own way of, of calculating it. But it's it's hard for me to see in the short term that that's not going to drive more of the action um, than um, than uh, whatever new liquidity is coming in. And as Michael, you know, from his expectations, he said it takes uh, about uh, three to nine months from uh, the, the liquidity cycle leads uh, the stock market by three to nine months or leads asset uh, asset prices three to nine months. You get your, your on, on the, the three month end, you get your most interest rate sensitive um, assets like precious metals and cryptos, like you said. But by nine months, you you get you know the general market, and and we are getting close. You know, we're on our probably two months away from nine months from the October lows. So it's going to be really interesting. I guess we should find out pretty quickly whether Michael's liquidity you know wins out or some of those um, those you know liquidity crunch factors that I just mentioned um, play out here. But but I'm curious this whole you know, continued weakness in the banking system and uh, more and more capital fleeing for the higher rates of uh, T-bills and money market funds. Um, how material do you think that is right now? And do you think that trend is going to continue for the at least immediate future here? I think it's huge because it, it speaks to a psychological shift that we're seeing in clients and prospects that we talk to, but you also see it in, in the markets. Um, you know, so much of, of this kind of linkage of liquidity to asset prices is a psychological component, right? I mean, you know, the last decade, uh, the psychology was I'm being punished by holding money in, in liquid reserves. So I, I got to go chase other things, right? That that psychology has shifted. We've seen it tangibly in, in the folks we talk to. And and I think the market at large is, 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 is seeing that. And, um, you know, it's still an uncertain picture on the job front. We, we, I think the ADP report came out with a, a beat to the upside here on, on, on new jobs. But at the same time, we're seeing job openings. I think the lowest in, since like 2001, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So there, there, and this gets back to Kantrowitz's uh, hope framework. And there, there are some elements that are starting to look like that. That E piece of the uh, hope uh, mnemonic is starting to, um, you know, um, the, the the employment market is, is is starting to look like it could be, you know, kind of tempering, you know, kind of playing out the cycle there, which which we think would lead to more of a recessionary type thing and and not a, a, a liquidity driven asset um, advance. Yeah, um, there's a lot more to dig into that that jobs data, which maybe next week we can we can do here, um, John. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of new data coming out that was contained in those both the jolts and the ADP reports. Um, one of the ones off the top of my head is that the quit rate is has has been coming down fairly substantially, and I think that's an important one to look at because that's very sentiment driven, right? And when you talk about the difference between being bearish and being scared or whatever, right? Um, quits are a great indicator of of sentiment, right? If people are feeling confident that hey, I can get another job anytime I want, you know, quit rate obviously goes up, and it's been you know, a, a near record highs, if not record highs for much of the past couple of years. That's beginning to fast cool, which I think is, you know, an important indicator that all of a sudden the the consumer, uh, sorry, the, the worker is feeling increasingly less confident. Um, and I, I think once we start hearing uh, from employers, you know, the, the, the narrative is still, hey, it's really hard to find good, um, you know, it's really hard to find good workers. It's hard to fill our open positions. Once we hear that tune start to change, like, oh, you know, actually we're finally being able to fill our positions or, hey, it's not nearly as hard to, to get a good worker as it was. That I think is is really the game on to say, okay, that that last domino, that E in the hope framework is probably gonna shift. Um, all right, Mike, coming back to you here, um, I guess we should talk just for a second about the the Fed meeting, even though, you know, we're not going to know the result. Once folks are watching this video, they're going to know what the result was. And like I said, we'll dive deeply into it next week, folks. Um, but uh, even with uh, with Kaplan there, 
uh, urging Powell to uh, to pause. Um, you know, I'll put my hat in the ring, and I, I, I've said this multiple times the past two weeks or so. I think we get one more hike. I think we get a, a 25 basis point hike here. I think that's probably going to be the last hike that the Fed makes. Um, you know, I, I, I think CPI has been coming down. It's seeing the progress that it needs on inflation. It's seeing all sorts of cracks in the system. You know, the banking woes being a really, you know, key one of those. Uh, so I think I think it's beginning to worry that hey, if we keep being too aggressive here, we could really create some systemic instability here. Uh, also, with those additional um, bank tightening lenders, like I said, the bank, the, the Fed is thinking is is looking at this as okay. The banks are starting to do some of our work for us as well. So my sense is that we we will most likely switch to pause after this one. I'm not sure if that Powell's going to say he's going to pause today. I'm not sure he's going to announce it, but my guess is he'll probably say, you know what, given all these factors, we're going to be very data driven and we're going to take a wait and see approach. And, you know, I'll let you know at the next Fed meeting what we decide to do. Uh, but but just to stick my neck out, I'll say this is probably the last one we see for a good long while. And um, I think uh, Powell will, will then start his all right, I'm going to pause for the end of the year campaign. Of course, we'll have debate, I think, for a long time whether he'll be able to do that. But I, I think that's what starts here. Curious to get a sense of what you think. Yeah, obviously, everyone in the world likes to guess at what the Fed's going to do. And and um, the, the Fed doesn't really want the market to be surprised, I don't think. It's pretty pretty common consensus that the Fed will raise rates maybe uh, 0.25% or 25 basis points today. Uh, that's probably what they're going to do. I wouldn't expect Powell to say, I'm not going to do any more. I don't think he wants to give that kind of certainty to the market. I think he wants to keep some tools in reserve. But to my opinion, I really don't think that there's a risk of Powell creating a disruption in markets by saying something or by hiking too little or too much. I think the disruption in the markets is there, and it has been there for years. It's really a uh, it's a result of 10 years of quantitative easing, more than 10 years now. So, I mean, the reserves that are in the system are just massive. You know, they're just massive. The, 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 the Fed's balance sheet up around nine trillion or so, starting maybe um, just under one trillion 10 years ago. Um, you know, bank reserves are, I think, around three trillion right now, which we're paying. The Fed is paying 5% interest on excess reserves. I think that's quick math, about 150 billion a year that they're paying um, you know, member banks on excess reserves. They're earning only about you know, two and a half percent or so on average on securities in their portfolio. They're probably losing if they were to mark the market, you know, seven, I'm just, I'm, I'm guessing here, 75 billion, 100 billion a year, and not to mention the mark to market losses on the bonds in their portfolio. So to say that they, they're going to cause an accident if they go a quarter point too much or too little, in my opinion, kind of misses the point. The accident is already there. It's already baked in the cake. The reason why we're seeing these bank failures, um, and there's probably more to come, is because the system is awash in liquidity. There's a lot of liquidity. There's too much liquidity. You know, and maybe Michael's right in that there's going to be even more. You know, he talks about the, the central banks bailing out governments in the future. Maybe they will. Maybe they can bail out some small governments, but who's going to bail out the United States government if, if that happens? Now, I don't want to sound like I'm all doom and gloom here because, frankly, I agree with him that the U.S. dollar is likely to stay strong for several years, maybe more. Um, we are in a U.S. dollar denominated system. That's not likely to change anytime soon. Maybe that changes five to 10 years down the road, but in the next couple of years, the dollar probably stays stronger. Um, and, and a lot of your guests have talked about that, particularly Brent Johnson, in just a, that was just a few weeks ago, talked about the dollar milkshake theory and how he thinks the dollar index could go much higher. I, I've heard him in the past say maybe 150 he thinks it could go to. Uh, I, I don't know about that, but it's right around 102 right now. I would not be surprised to see the dollar hit new highs, 120, 130, particularly during an economic crisis. So that's likely to happen. But it's a lot of faith to put in the central banks that they're going to be able to bail out this problem, that they're going to be able to bail out governments. The problem is too much liquidity, not too little liquidity. And uh, yeah, all of these banks, many of these banks went out and locked in long-term rates. They wanted to get some certainty on their balance sheet. Short-term rates shot up. Um, and then there's a mismatch in liabilities. It's a big problem. So 
The big picture, macro picture, is we're hideously overvalued in the stock market still. The technical, uh, the, the, the technical picture is not great. The charts look like they're in a downtrend, have been for 15 months. We get some kind of surprise to the, to the downside. I think it's an elevated drop down to 3,200 or so. And again, all of that really doesn't it doesn't hinge on what Powell says today at two o'clock Eastern, you know, or what the release is. So we'll see. Just a couple of things I'd like to say in, in closing as well. Gold is looking fantastic. It's trading at around 2,030 right now, a giant cup and handle formation. The miners are looking good. GDX is trading right around 35. And I think if gold clears 2100 with some conviction, it goes right to 2500. So we'll see. But that's what the technical picture looks like. And we don't know what the Fed's going to say or won't say to make that happen. I can't, I, I can't, I can't even begin to guess. But the technical picture looks strong. And maybe the gold market has figured out that we're nearing the end game of all of this. I don't know. Um, so in, in, in as far as the S&P goes, one more thing that I wrote down here that I wanted to mention. It's extremely heavily weighted. Apple is presently 8% of that index, roughly. Trades at a price to earnings ratio of 28 or so uh, on forward estimated earnings, which are uh, richly valued estimates, uh, very rosy estimates. It's a good company, but geez, it's, it's almost a $3 trillion company trading at 28 times uh, estimates, and it's 8% of the S&P. So the S&P has actually been pretty resilient because the NASDAQ, as I mentioned earlier, is up 20%. The S&P is up 8%. So it's really sticky to the upside. If you look at the Russell 2000, which is mid to small cap stocks, it's technically a lot weaker. So the S&P is being held up by the strength of the NASDAQ and particularly by the strength in Apple. That can work both ways. Apple has some kind of surprise to the downside. It could accelerate the entire market down. So technical picture isn't great. The fundamentals in terms of valuations aren't great. And the Fed has done a really good job of greasing the skids on this on this exit plan, but I really think it's baked in the cake, and that the accident is baked in the cake, and has been for a long time. Nobody knows what the pin's going to be, but I, but I would expect it to be known during the latter half of this year. All right, I, I do want to talk about one potential pin real quick. Just want to give a quick commercial to folks. You talked about uh, the technical picture, Mike. Uh, right after I finish up with you guys, I'm going to be uh, interviewing technical analyst Milton Berg, um, and that video will follow, come out the day after this one airs. So for folks that are looking for, uh, you know, an updated outlook on on what the whole science of technical analysis is telling us, we'll have a very fresh update on that there with Milton. Um, but in terms of a, a potential trigger here, um, we have the debt ceiling. Right. So uh, news came out this week that uh, the Treasury just announced that it it may have exhausted the, you know, the 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 funding for it, the extraordinary measures that it's currently using right now uh, by as soon as June first. Right. That's what's called the X date. Right. So that's not very far away. That's less than a month away now at this point in time. Um, and and once you hit the X date, that's when the government actually does have to start you know, the, the belt tightening, right? That's when they start furloughing employees, you know, uh, delaying payments out to contractors, shutting down national parks, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, like as we, we, we sort of talked about this a little bit in the past, right? I, I don't know anybody that doesn't think that the ceiling isn't going to eventually get raised. Uh, it just seems like the repercussions of that would be far too nuclear. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to have a lot of uh, drama between now and then, um, a lot of political theater. And, um, you know, the Republicans are talking a pretty, you know, mean game in terms of uh, concessions that they want. Uh, they just passed a plan last week that um, apparently, you know, you read the articles, uh, is declared dead on arrival uh, when uh, when it gets to the Senate in terms of um what the Republicans are asking for. And, and of course, the, the Democrats have uh, control of the Senate so they can shoot that down. Um, so uh, it doesn't seem like the sides are very close together right now is what I'm saying. And so uh, the question right now is sort of how much will the Republicans hold the debt ceiling uh, hostage, you know, uh, over the next month plus on this, right? It's happened in the past. 
right? The government has technically shut down, uh, you know, over an impasse on the debt ceiling uh, prior. I'm trying to remember when that happened the last uh, 10 years ago or something like that. Um, so I'm curious to see if you guys have uh, ha have any thoughts about that. But but I, I definitely can see potential that, uh, and I just read an article about it this morning, which is that the Republicans may stick to their guns long enough that uh, the market, you know, starts getting really worried and uh, they'll use a market drop and, and the fears and concerns around that as a forcing function to force the Democrats to come to the table with them and at least, you know, eke out some concessions of what they want. I think they know they're not going to get everything that they're asking for, but they might use that that market pain uh, as a lever to get the Democrats to agree to some concessions. Um, John, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about this. Oh boy, that's a that's a realm of crazy that <laughs> that I I don't have uh, any expertise uh, more than the next guy or gal. Um, you know, I think we know that politicians will go to great lengths to uh, play chicken for political points. Um, I, I I think at the end of the day, it, it, they're going to do what they always do. They they'll they'll create some drama and they'll come to some some uh, agreement where each side claims victory and the other, you know getting the other one to concede on things and uh you know it's basically political theater um but yeah i think there very well could be um financial market um rever reverberation you know uh, uh reverbs going through uh in relation to that um and, and in fact it's political uh 101 to create um create uh, uh crises to to get your way right so so I, I I have a little doubt that that it's going to be a, a political theater that's going to be frustrating for us all to watch, and the markets will probably be frustrated with it too. Yeah, to, to me it just seems like you know we, we've got so many other things that are kind of keeping the market on its heels right now. Um, or I shouldn't say keeping it on its heels because the market you know is is higher than it was when it started the year, but th th there's so many potential destabilizers out there. We've talked about a number of them today. That to have sort of this one in the mix just just isn't helpful, right? It just it just increases the probability that something might end up, you know, going in a direction that nobody intended, and then it might be kind of hard to stop uh, to stop, right? Um, so, anyways, not we don't know. We'll be tracking it closely on this program for folks, but it is another risk factor that we kind of don't need right now, and it's one that does have some probability that there's you know, there's a political incentive maybe to create a little bit of market instability here, right? So uh, we'll see if they actually play that card or not. Um, all right. Well, look, as we uh, as we begin to wrap up here, um, I, I did just want to note, John and Mike, I don't know if you guys had a chance uh, to watch the video that um, we released yesterday uh, with Dr. Art Laffer, um, who is an economist who has been an economic advisor to administrations since the early 70s. I think he started with Ford. He then was an economic advisor to Reagan. Um, he's advised, uh, I think, almost every president since in some way, shape, or form. Um, really fascinating conversation. Um, folks, if you haven't watched that, I'll put up a link to it here. It's getting really great reviews. Um, uh, it's a really interesting, it's an engaging, he's a really engaging speaker um, and a fascinating guy. But it's he's got some, some I think, really interesting and thought stimulating policies that we discussed. Um, but again, I, I really value hearing the perspective of somebody who, you know, is in the mix and has been working with a lot of the people that have shaped economic policy and national policy over the past several decades. Um, the, the punchline is that he's not very optimistic right now, given the current policies that we're pursuing. Um, and he doesn't see a lot of room for optimism unless we make some pretty drastic policy changes, which he's got some great ideas for. Not entirely sure we're actually going to do that, though. Wouldn't wouldn't hold our breaths. Um, I did just want to note, though, at the end of the conversation, um, he did uh, kindly make some of his recent publications available uh, to Wealthion viewers. And so if you want to go read those, uh, just go to Wealthion.com slash Laffer and you can download them for free there. Um, all right, guys, we're looking wrapping up here. Um, just want to reiterate that you guys did a great job this week, as we do every week, of kind of painting the picture for why this is a challenging time for regular investors to try to navigate all this stuff on their own. And therefore, that's why we encourage people to work with a professional financial advisor who takes into account all the macro issues that you know Michael and I talked about and that you guys and I have been talking about here. 
Um, folks, if you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great. You should stick with them. But if you don't, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even John and Mike and their team there at New Harbor Financial, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, and you can have a free consultation uh, with these advisors. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with them. They just sit down with you. They evaluate your current you know, unique personal financial situation, give you their best advice on what they think you should do. You can go off and do it yourself. You can give those notes to your existing advisor, or you can keep talking to these guys if you like. Um, it's just a public service they offer. Um, all right, guys, with that, um, uh, John, I'll let you have the last word this week. Um, I know you're talking to lots of people day in, day out there. You you sort of gave a little hint earlier that that maybe sentiment is shifting a little bit and people are or maybe becoming a little bit more concerned, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what's your parting bit of advice to the viewers here based upon your conversations with the folks that are reaching out to you every day? Yeah, we, we are seeing an uptick in that. And, and it's because people are starting to, you know, look through the, you know, the realities of what this, what their savings mean to their lives. You know, they, they I think they're reminding themselves that they're not in this for the next month or three months. They're in for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And, and they've worked really hard and, and, um, you know they they are they're concerned about the security for the long term and and we think rightly so especially given what we talked about with valuations um i can't resist the uh temptation adam to to date you myself and mike here with a little reference a pop culture reference to uh, art laffer and i was racking my brains i recalled there being a movie in the 80s that that <laughs> um referenced uh laffer the laffer curve and it it, it it came back to me it was ferris bueller's day off and Ben Stein was the the teacher, the mono, monotone teacher, you know, Bueller, Bueller, and I couldn't I couldn't resist the urge to to <laughs> link Art Laffer back to that movie, and it just speaks to his his you know has been a a, 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 a notorious economist for a long time, you know, going back to, to that far. Yeah, great reference. I got a lot of those. In fact, if we can find the clip, uh, I'll, I'll play it here real quick. Today we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve. But yeah, um, deadpan Ben Stein, who is an economist himself, yeah. uh, not just an actor, an economist. Um, yeah, Bueller, Bueller. And then uh, uh, <laughs> the answer was, I remember, voodoo economics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to end. <laughs> Voodoo economics. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, thanks so much. If you enjoyed this uh, interview with Michael Howell, I uh, would like to see him return as well as other great guests like him. Uh, and if you enjoy these wrap ups with uh, John and Mike as much as I do, please support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below. Well, there's that little bell icon right next to it. And make sure to look down, even if you've been a viewer for a long time, look down and make sure that bell icon uh, is clicked. Um, that, you know, if it is, that's when you get an alert every time Wealthion publishes a new video, so you don't have to miss uh, an interview. But I've been hearing from folks that, that they, not everybody's getting uh, the alerts the way that they thought they would. And some are finding that YouTube, for whatever reason, has turned it off. So just make sure that it's turned on there so you get alerted of everything that uh, you want to watch here. Um, with that being said, John and Mike, guys, thanks so much for joining me for yet another week. Like I said, we're going to have a lot to talk about next week once we know the outcome of uh, the Fed announcement that's about to be uh, announced here. Um, but uh, great discussion. Look forward to chatting with you guys then. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Adam. See you soon. See you next week, Adam. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. 
We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. 